So this is the Rex monthly check-in call for October 2019. Uh, it is fall in Portland, Oregon. It is crispy and sunny today. I just came back from a road trip and I have a poem for us to start with titled, I Worried by Mary Oliver. It goes as follows. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading, or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? But finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and told, took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. Thank you for the sunshine, Bill. That's perfect. That was perfect. Um, so how about we check in? I've, I've, I've been all over the place. I have a bunch of stuff to, to report back on, but would love to hear what uh, mildly Rexy things any of you have been up to. Mm. Mm. I uh, added to my herd immunity by getting my flu, flu shot yesterday. Oh, good. So, I'm probably going to do that. Arm hurts like hell. Oh, really? Oh, great. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just, it's a, uh, for some reason, flu shots always hurt, hmm. at least for me. But I, not, I don't fall victim to, what is it, uh, Roseanne Barr syndrome. No, no. Uh, will, Julian. You suddenly be, will you suddenly become a redneck? <laughs> no, you, 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 uh, no, it's basically there's something you where you're... Guillain Barre. That's it. Same difference. Although the Roseanne Barr syndrome really does <laughs> provoke interesting thoughts. <clears throat> I sort of prefer that. I'd like to catch that. <laughs> Accompanied by a significant drop in IQ. Yeah. <laughs> it is a problem. Mm. Uh, anyone else? Rexy sort of things? Kelly, how's the consortium doing? What's, uh, what's top of mind for you guys these days? We're doing pretty great. I am at the coffee shop today, so there's, there's some background noise. Because my, cool. my family's home because it's no school, so I came to the coffee shop thinking it might be a little quieter. But anyway. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Big win on that front. Yeah. Oh, well. Six and one, half dozen. Hmm. Um, we just had our executive summit in Colorado Springs, so it cracked me up that you were also just there. Oh, wow. Wow. I was at the Garden of the Gods Club, which apparently is kind of fancy. That's awesome. I had I, I would join the Garden of the Gods Club. That's an amazing yeah. little spot over there. That was just um, at the end, so go ahead. We, we were at uh, the Lodge at Flying Horse, which is has just unbelievable views of the whole mountain range from the meeting room, which is like our favorite way to do it. Um, but it was uh, a couple of very interesting things. Ray, everybody's still, so these are all support executives, people who are looking to design um, support and service organizations for big, mostly high-tech companies. And everybody's talking about the digital transformation, which we've been talking about for a couple of years. And, rah, rah, rah. and finally, people are like, wait, I think actually what we mean is a cultural transformation. <laughs> so that was pretty cool to kind of finally have have this shift be like so one of the one of the people in the meeting was like um it seems like if this were plug and play we would have done it already and so i it, this is this feels like something sort of bigger in terms of how we're how we're approaching these problems like the digital transformation sort of already happened now culturally we have to catch up on our in our organizations which was really fun because I don't know if I talked about this last time on our Rex call, but I was at a coaching um, workshop uh, just recently. So coaching is one of the things that we talk about as being integral to this knowledge management methodology that we've been working on for did. 20 yep. years. And, and my, my theory is that coaching is really how we shift the um, organization culturally because it's, it's conversations between people and as culture is emergent. When you, if, you, if you can make space to talk to each other intentionally about what's going on in the, in the organization and with us sort of even just tangentially personally, right? This is what's going on for me at work right now with the, talking that through with a peer, I think has huge implications for what the, what the, what the emergent culture of the organization does. So 
that's kind of what we're what we're noodling on. And then, um, and tomorrow I leave for Germany for two, a two day meeting, which is for a two day meeting. Wow. going to be a long haul from Seattle, but yeah. um, I'm looking forward to it. That's just me and Matt, who's our new, our new executive director. So cool. What city do you, do you get to go to? I'm going to Hanover. Oh, nice. Which My grandmother the, was from Hanover and I've really never been there. I think I've been there one day. So we were sort of dying laughing because on the Wikipedia page, there's a there's something called the Red Line in Hanover, which connects all their 36 culturally important, you know, stops. So you go and walk the Red Line and have a coffee here and go to this museum and blah, blah. And so we're on the Wikipedia page, and it, <laughs> the description was, uh, this was, they built the Red Line uh, in order to counteract the, the assertion that Hanover was the most boring city in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, fantastic. Perfect. Looking forward Look, to it. Look, we have a red line. Right. <laughs> Take that, Frankfurt okay. and Mainz. <laughs> so that's the scoop. That. Sunny, sunny and crisp in Seattle, too. I'm, yeah. loving, I'm loving the fall season right now. It, like, it's good. It's perfect. Yeah, that's fun in California right now. The, uh, mm, the, the weather. Blackouts? Um, it's been, well, the blackouts have been. M- for the most part, more threat than realization. But I think that's in part intentional. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric was uh, declared to have uh, be at fault for the for massive wildfires in the past few years. Uh, and all sorts of restrictions being put on how much they can, they can uh, pass the costs on to customers and the like. So they're basically being punished for not maintaining their lines properly. Um, and this, I believe, is um, punitive safety blackouts. I think it's on They're the part. getting even with California? It's, compli- it's uh, what are they called? Malicious compliance. You know, we're, okay, you want us to be, to be more careful? We're going to be as careful as absolutely possible. And the inconvenience you? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, so some things, I think, uh, since the Berkeley Hills are in the, the zone of potentially unsafe and high winds and bad lines, uh, the power get, has been shut off to, has finally been shut off to UC Berkeley. Uh, so Janice is home because she works on campus, but they were saying they were gonna shut it off on Wednesday. So they sent everybody home, uh, but power was on the whole day. So basically hmm. the university, had to pay all their employees for doing nothing on Wednesday. And then, mm-hmm. well, we'll shut it down. We'll shut it down Wednesday night, Thursday morning. Thursday rolls in. No, power's fine. Um, but everyone is it still stays at home because PG&E says, we're going to shut it off. We're going to shut it off. They finally shut it off wow. Thursday afternoon. But it's been crazy. Uh, and so you have a massive economic disruption, massive pr- disruption of people's lives. And PG&E being technically correct that they are being, they're trying to be as safe as possible mm-hmm. by, you know, eliminating the possibility of uh, high winds leading to sparks, leading to wildfires. Um, so it's, it's a, this has been kind of surreal, just this moment of we're going to shut down the state because we can, because this is what you want us to do, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just so weird. I mean, even, and I thought that there were some pretty large swaths of just residential areas that were in fact blacked out and the food well, in your, the food in your freezer done, the, like everybody's freezer just got shot, you know, shot. I'm like, that's, that's a lot of money. Oxygen. Like, people who are on oxygen. Yeah. Or yeah. Supple, um, the, Medical one, gear. the thing about some neighborhoods being, having the power shut off and that they actually have been, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of homes. It's because the, the, uh, the lines upstream have been are dangerous. shut off, are dangerous. Right. So those right. are closed down and then... Everything, everything downstream suffers, yeah. Right, right. So What's, what's the name for a, like a work rule stoppage when a union doesn't really want to go on strike, but they want to be really mean? They just tell everybody, follow all the rules. Like work turns, order or something like that? Something like that, right? And it just, everything grinds to a halt because there's no way you can actually follow all the rules anyplace. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to speak a little to this. Uh, first of all, my wife is an executive at a grocery store company mm. that has stores in California. So her day was not fun yesterday <clears throat> because imagine these spoilers in the store and how much. Yeah. Is. 
<clears throat> Second of all, uh, I posted uh, on my Facebook page, I posted all the investigations around this pg and &E thing. And I, because I, you know, I pay the bills for my mother's house in Carmel Valley, I got that little letter from pg and &E. mm -hmm. And I pointed out when I got it to my wife and my friends, hey, looky here, look at this letter here. So let's review what happened with pg and &E. So California, it's not the fifth largest economy in the world. What is it now? Maybe the sixth or seventh largest oh. economy in the world? Fourth? 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 Fourth. Fourth. Okay. So let's just look at this. We got California that has now has shanty towns. And now you're having South America style black rolling blackouts. And you are the fourth richest economy in the world. Okay. <clears throat> mm. So the investigations that next California is a utility. Uh, PG&E is a utility. So if tomorrow PG&E, which means they get a guaranteed profit margin. Okay. So what that means is if they wanted to fix those power lines, they just go, hey, well, that's going to cost a trillion dollars. They go to the California's, you know, the regulating board go, it's going to cost a trillion dollars. And there's really, it'll be done. But so apparently, apparently Jamir was saying that they have lim they have very big limits on what they can charge. Yeah, the, the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, has actually yeah. been fairly careful about careful slash restrictive about how much money they authorize. Mm -hmm. So and good, I really got to be checked out. That out. So it's a combination of basically bad governance and inertia on PG&E's part. So it's either then this is what the Wall Street Journal part, but again, you just have to know by the restraint of the system. Yeah. As a utility, it's either the state stop them from doing it, and though there are power line parts of this grid, they're almost a hundred years old. Okay, mm -hmm. so now let's think about this. We're talking about Silicon Valley. We're talking about California. <clears throat> let's just—is everyone tracking with me that if you guys have a hundred-year-old power system, a power grid, that just something ain't right here? <laughs> um, so, by the way, Germany also has these problems. Um, Germany has a, if you go all over Germany, which I guess, Kelly, you're going to soon find out, they don't exactly uh, have great internet um, because they are very good about balanced budgets and austerity. Uh, we almost, so what was the typical economic response, FYI, to a near depression, 08, 09? Oh, fiscal spending. But no, we do tax cuts instead. We do austerity. So in other words, I think this, this is happening all over the OECD countries, us and others that we have creaking infrastructure that we really need to do something about. But instead, just because of ideology and more tax breaks for rich people, we're not taking care of business. The fourth largest economy in the world, which think about the talent in California. If there's one place in the world to build a 21st century power grid and have the talent, the people, and the money to do it, it's California. Actually, the grid, the grid eventually goes away. Much of the grid goes away. What you do is you get local self-sufficiency with micropower and a bunch of other stuff. And hopefully, the large pieces of the smaller communities that are far away don't need to be bridged with high power lines. They wind up being mostly self-sufficient, I think. Jamey probably knows much more about this than, than I do. But, yeah. but it, feels like, it feels like the grid as it stands is slowly going to fall away anyway. Now, the grid as it stands is, is incompatible with the move to uh, a largely electricity-based transportation base. Right. Um, you know, we, got, we, we got a Tesla recently, you know, just a Model 3, so not, you know, not the hugely expensive kind, but, you know, it's cool. And it's, um, it's amazing. To, God, I love driving that thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, if we don't it's really hard to find a place to charge if you have a power outage in your town. You know, we can't charge, you know, if we had an outage, we can't charge at home. Um, mm -hmm. The superchargers in the neighborhood, well, that's all part of the same grid. So one of the things that, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons that Tesla is actually selling these home, these big home batteries. Right. So that you have a, a well of electricity that you can call on in case of an outage. Um, and that links up with people who have uh, home solar. Because if you have home home power generation, the stand put in in the standard way, you have a power out. The power goes out in the neighborhood. Your power is out too. It doesn't matter if you have mm -hmm. the sun shining because basically you're connected to the grid. You're just another component on the larger grid. Right. So if you have a home battery that's basically looping in and charging in for some of that stuff, you know, some of the power that you're that you're generating, then you can be roughly okay for a short while. But um, 
but but both writers it's all it's all we're, we're dealing with legacy infrastructure um and some of it is not being ha, has not been uh, repaired and revised because it's expensive some of it has not been repaired and revised because of legacy social and political infrastructure uh some of it has not been repaired and revised because of um you know legal issues because mm -hmm. you know whatever legal issues might come up and frankly when you have people who when you do have issues of uh, attempts to repair and revise there's this real question well how do you do it do you build towards a um a modular grid uh, where you have local uh, local self-sufficiency or do you build for resilience where you have lots of places that are self-sufficient but then have cross-sufficiency uh it's <sighs> So please, yeah, and so do you know, know. For the futurist, please tell me while you live in the fourth richest you know country in the world and you have shanty towns and a power grid. You know, well, I you know, am I, like, the shanty towns aren't in my neighborhood. No, uh, you have shanty. Well, you have because it's the largest you're population. Too far wise, away from the downtown. It's you have shanty towns because, I'll, well, for a variety of reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes some of it comes from really high cost of living, so you have people being driven out of their homes. Some of it comes because cities, big cities, and other states like to give one-way tickets to California to their homeless people, and so we have an influx of homeless people coming into California who are not, who did not lose their homes in California. Um, yeah, we live in Portland, so Jerry and I, um, we have shanty towns that are moved around all the time. They occupy yeah. park, they push them out. So, you know, I'm not just pointing fingers, but this is, let's just say one thing. There isn't a shortage of resources to take care of these problems. We as yeah. a society are simply making some bad choices. We are, and we have, have for a while. And so that's, you say, you know, fourth, fourth largest economy, fifth for, for a long time. Um, we have progressive leadership now, but, you know, we just recently had, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and then, you know, Gray Davis before that, who was ostensibly a Democrat, but was very you know, tell. well named. Um, you had, uh, oh, who's uh, Pete Wilson? Mm. This, was, this is not the well, ability. And we just, back when just recently, Reagan. just recently ha have, have the supermajority in the uh, legislature. So finally able to pass some laws to do, to rebuild some stuff that we couldn't do before. Because and there was, go on. And, and, and they're now being sued. So, so the Trump administration is suing the major automakers because they've chosen to follow California's auto standards, which are higher than the ones that are being rolled back federally. And they're being sued for that because Trump doesn't want any, you know, anybody going around is releasing all this. A, a couple of things just to, to throw in. Um, the event I, I uh, the second to last event I was at in, uh, included Ramez Nam as a speaker. Mm. Have you ever seen him speak? Oh yeah, um, so he. Mez uh, is he, great. I love him. He's a science fiction writer and and all about energy. Then he has chart after chart after chart after chart after chart, which are all well done and interesting. Uh, where I'm pretty convinced we're walking into an abundant energy future. Like like the, in particular, the cost of solar mm -hmm. have plunged way faster than anybody in the industry foresaw. In fact, the EIA or whatever the the the, the famous the funniest of all the charts that that anybody's showing these days on energy are the predictions, the forecasts from the association that's supposed to represent energy in this way. And their forecasts all kind of go like this. This is, you know, the, the, the falling cost of, of power and the actual falling cost of power is like that. And, and then they and you every year's forecast. revision. <laughs> every year's revision is no better than the previous one. No better at all. It's just like a parallel lumpy line. And, and you start thinking about what are the implications of distributed power. You start thinking a lot also about uh, alternate storage methods, like how do we do batteries? You know, there, there's one system uh, that basically hauls bricks up into a big tower and uses potential energy, and that's a battery, right? That, that's a battery. You can do water. You can make you a little water. artificial lake. You can that's pump water good. up and pump water down. So those are all batteries because you store energy and you can, you can you know, attach a, a, a turbine or a dynamo to these things and turn it back into electricity. We're actually, we have some really interesting ideas around uh, large scale energy storage uh, uh, and energy production for that matter. So, you know, beyond, beyond solar, although photo, as Mez says, photovoltaics are dropping in, in cost at a, at a ridiculously fast rate. Um, base load power with thorium, uh, also really funky stuff around uh, what they call hydrokinetic energy that is the motion the motion of the ocean um, so under you know underwater uh, tidal flows and the like 
you know, gen basically a constant generation of power. It's the the real fantastic. I'm sorry. It's Oregon's fantastic. We had this yep. huge title change, and the technology is all developed in Norway. It's ready to go, baby. Yep. Uh, the the main difficulty remains uh, small scale storage, because yeah, and that's actually we. I love driving a Tesla, but it's essentially Bay Area driving only. Uh, we did a. It, it ostensibly has a 240 mile range. We did a drive up to Chico uh, earlier in the year, which is um, 150 miles away. We had to recharge twice along the way. We were using the air conditioning mm -hmm. and you know, there are some hills to climb. And you know, the, it, it has a particular range under ideal conditions, but it just simply doesn't store enough power. The, the so, energy density of gasoline is unmatched. Why doesn't and somebody we, create mobile electric recharging stations? Basically take a large truck, put a big battery on it, run it on the freeway, and then we do what, what, what jet fighters do uh, in refueling on, on the freeway. Boom, boom, boom. Exactly. Just, yeah, boom, just boom, 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 the sound of the cars colliding. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, you dock. You go, in, you go into follow me mode and you basically... Um, you, 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 slave, you trust you, Tesla a lot more than I do. You slave your car to the truck. <laughs> I, I trust uh, Tony Stark. He'll he'll like. <laughs> you made, you made, did you ask for the ejector seats option in your in your Tesla, man? Actually, no. We, we <laughs> the metaphorical. No, we didn't. We did not get the full self-driving package because I just know how crappy bad that is, and frankly, doesn't have the right gear to make it work right. Because there's it, no lidar on. Tesla. No lidar. Um, only cameras. Only cameras, and uh, I think and other that, sensors probably. Yeah. Now. Cameras are very, that's kind of cool. We actually, it provides a built-in car security system. You just plug a USB stick and it does a, it loops a recording of all the cameras. <coughs> um, but- uh, Well, that's a useful feature in our uh, new gilded age of extreme income disparity. Exactly. If key lots try to like touch your Tesla, you got it. Did you, did you see the report about the woman who was caught keying a Tesla a couple of weeks no. ago by, by the car video? And, oh, uh, you tell me, fellow aristocrat, to me, what did, did you do? Did, did the car incinerate her with laser beams right after? No, they didn't. She didn't get that option, or the person no. getting to own the car didn't Should get that option. Should have bought that package. Yeah, that's yeah. That's they keep telling us, but we went to, you know, did you, did you, did you, are expensive. I'm sorry. Did you do the karaoke upgrade yet? How's that work? Uh, you know, we might have it did auto updates, but uh, uh, no pun intended. I think about that. Um, yeah. But uh, we haven't been playing. We don't really play with it. It's 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 functional. It, it, it's swoopy what technology. What about your role as a, as the world's leading futurist? Don't you need to like, you know, mod this thing and make sure that it hops over traffic? And now we now we get to use his <laughs> like his calling against him. This is gonna be great. <laughs> Yeah, okay. man, why don't you have every video game and everything? Do you realize how far this is an infinite regress <laughs> on space life? I. I suppose I'm just a failure. I apologize for that. <laughs> Me too, Jermaine. I'm a failure too. Uh, oh, man. Uh, so I also wanted to go back to the, the housing thing. Um, uh, housing first strategies are working really well in cities that are applying them. It just uh, temporary shelter doesn't actually get solve anybody's problem except for one night at a time. But getting people in simple, affordable um, housing uh, lets them have an address, lets them get showered, lets them maybe get a job, a bunch of other stuff. You also, have to fold. You have to fold into this uh, mental health and addiction. So and not so, don't demand that they be off drugs and all clean before they get in the housing too. It's, un, it's unconditional. It's unconditional. You just give them a place to be. And, and there's studies show that that's fantastic. That's it great. actually helps. And then Portugal seems to be over and over again a really great example because. Yeah. Um, in 2001, they de decriminalized all drugs. Yep. Uh, they have a, a president who's done a really good job. They, they, they said to the austerity threateners during the last depression, they basically said a few and right. uh, didn't do that. And the population's better off. And they just had a, they're just, I think, in the middle of a new election. They have a strange coalition that has a really interesting guy in charge uh, who I think is getting reelected through strange coalitions, but in a, in a good way. So. So Portugal, I think, is a, is a place to watch. And right next door, Spain is in meltdown. So, um, you know, th there's little bits. Also, uh, Ethiopia, the Ethiopia's new president just won the Nobel Peace Prize. They announced it this morning. And he's the guy who, the moment he comes into office, basically creates an amnesty for the, the war they've been having with, with uh, 
Eritrea. Eritrea. Mm-hmm. Eritrea. Yeah, and, and, and totally changes the situation. It's incredible. Yay, yay for the good news. Thank you, Jared. You're welcome. And then, and then um, the, other, the other event I was at, at the beginning of this trip, I went straight to uh, Visioneering. Anybody heard of Visioneering? <clears throat> Anybody heard of the close any- to Mouseketeering, some Disney thing? It's mm-hmm. a little bit like Mouseketeering, actually. You'd be shocked how close that is. Um, so anybody heard of the X Prize? So the Ansari X Prize was the first X Prize. That was basically for suborbital, um, you know, a private private company get uh, above 140 or 100 kilometers uh, twice within two weeks, uh, mm-hmm. and and bring and bring everybody back to Earth safely. Uh, yeah, and uh, Bert Rutan and his company basically won it. Uh, with Spaceship One and, you know, big check handed over. And then, and that was back in 96 or 97 or 98, somewhere in there. And then the XPRIZE people were like, wow, that worked. Now what do we do? So then they started doing a bunch of, a bunch of these XPRIZES on whatever. Then they, they had at one point, um, at one point after a, more, a board meeting or something like that, they just stayed, they just kept talking uh, into the night and had a terrific conversation about what the next prizes should be. That turned into the Visioneering Conference, which is now a three-day event. Uh, highly produced. This one was held on the Paramount Studios lot <clears throat> um, and was really interesting. And I, I got invited in. I got, you know, comped in to, to go see it. And one of the things that made me very, very happy that the whole thing was a, a, a strange mix of naive philanthropists with a lot of money ponying up money for projects you were like, I'm not sure that's ever going to actually work. So there was, there was a bunch of that going on. But um, Dave, you would be shocked at how up front and center regenerative ag was and the re- less so the regenerative economy but the regenerative ag was was big and the regenerative ag project that i was kind of part of uh early in the going was like runner up um there's like everybody votes 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 and one one of the initiatives shows up as the xprize winner which means that xprize is going to put more energy behind it but along the way Anybody in the audience can fund, you know, at half a million dollars, any one of these things is fully funded, which means a project team will go like make it start happening. And so a bunch of these other projects got fully funded along the way. So it's not like that, like the, the one thing is the only thing that floats out of visioneering. So it's really pretty interesting as a fundraising mechanism. It's awesome. Uh, everything was high production values. Nya, 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 nya. Um, but, uh, but I was, I was happy at how, normal regenerative ag sounded and how emphatic the people behind it were that this is it's it's carbon sequestration it's better and more food it saves small farmers it replenishes the aquifer it it's like a you know it's like not just the trifecta but is there a quadrifecta <clears throat> i don't know but it's just it's just got a whole lot of bang for the buck so biodiversity biodiversity thank you exactly uh, probably good for insects and all that as well because you're not doing any, you're not doing fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, you're doing a bunch of compost, so it's really good for the compost makers. Uh, but Dave, I, I, are you seeing a lot of, like, what's happening in Rasa and, and sort of the Regen sector right now? We're, 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 what's your like finger in the wind? Uh. Yeah, I, I, I did do, I did like the Google Trends uh, kind of thing with, with regenerative ag and sustainable ag a couple of weeks ago. And, and you can see a pretty steady climb in the use of the term regenerative ag. And it actually has now spiked over sustainable ag a couple of times. So, you know, I think the dominant term would probably still be sustainable ag, but regeneration is clearly growing, which I think means adoption of the term. Um, you know, who knows what people mean by it when they say it. It's right. got, it got mentioned a couple of times in the, like, um, O'Rourke, I think, mentioned in one of the debates, and so did Tim Ryan. So it, it's got a little bit of play in, in politics. And then, you know, it's got some pretty rich proponents. So Elon Musk's brother's kind of involved, and um, Eric Schmidt's wife, and, you know, you've got, you've got big chunks of cash um, that are engaged in this stuff. It does seem like people, you know, sell their software company and then buy a regenerative ranch. Um, so it's a it's a fun toy, but and and I, as near as I can tell, the ideas are pretty sound. So you know, I, I kind of suspect we will continue to see it, you know, uh, uh, taking off. 
it's a real battle with the, you know, we, we did do this thing 50 years ago or something with, you know, Earl Butt saying agriculture was go big or go home kind of in the industrialization of agriculture. And right. But right. a lot of effort behind that, I think. And so well, Nixon, uh, Nixon told Butts to basically make carbs cheap. And so that's oh. why we have, that's why we have really cheap carbs now. Like, like a whole bunch of things were thrown into place that, that gave us the program we're now suffering from and like the diabetes spikes and everything else. So it's kind of weird. I mean, you know, we, you know, we have these, these, I mean, I try not to go back in history and think that these were decisions were incredibly cynical. Um, you know, even a PG and E, you know, it's like, I don't think they're deliberately not maintaining the lines. You know I mean? It's not, yeah. but, but sometimes you look and say, wow, that one looks pretty cynical. You know, what was, what was that? So anyway, so I, anyway, I think it's, I think it's exciting that the, you know, like in my little world of trying to be advocates for regenerative ag, it's still a very small, um, fractured kind of, you know, stumbling effort, I'd say. So mm -hmm. and the one thing I noticed the other day, I was, I was at a conference here in San Francisco uh, called uh, Soil Not Oil. Mm -hmm. And I, can't remember, I don't think I mentioned this to you, Jerry, but I can't remember that one of the things that, that um, it, you know, I'm like this moderate kind of, you know, fat white guy with policy background, right? Um, and the conference overlapped with some anti-vaccine themes, uh, with wow. uh, five, five G is going to kill us kind of messaging. That was a big piece. Um, certainly a lot of, you know, um, stuff around uh, GMOs. And, and uh, so it was kind of this weird anti-science component as well that I was a little bit uncomfortable with. It's like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. How do these different, um, how do these different communities overlap? It's, it, yeah, it's, it's really interesting when something natural shows up, the conversation includes those kinds of people. His nickname was Rusty, uh, Rusty Butts, exactly. You're, you're totally on it, Jermaine. I am 14 years old. <laughs> well, you don't always start with fart jokes here on the calls, so I, I don't know that that's true. The, no, they're, they're, they're silent but deadly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, so has regenerative, sorry, Dave, <clears throat> has regenerative kind of picked up and superseded what permaculture was 10 years ago? I mean, <clears throat> 10 years ago, you got rich, you went and built a permaculture farm. <clears throat> I think permaculture is a reasonable subset of, of regen, right? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of the ideas, the kind of the framework comes out of permaculture. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. And I don't know why one word is catching on over the other. I would say, yeah, I'm not sure why. And regenerative works better with, in other frameworks, like you were saying, regenerative economy kinds of things. I mean, I still get excited about, I mean, I, I'm interested, I've been involved with agriculture primarily because we saw a lot of farms that you could point at that were regenerative and were successful. You can go visit a regenerative farm and tell that it's different. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just very, it's a bright spot kind of thing. But I like sticking regenerative in front of everything just because I end up with different, you know, it's, to me, it means positive sum. And, yeah. and I think that the positive, somehow we've been, you know, it's economics. I think it's the, when we study economics, it's the allocation of scarcity. You never get to a positive sum framework. So people aren't used to thinking about it. And so I felt like a switch flipped. And it was like, whoa, you could go past that line. What would happen then? And so the word regenerative for me means going past that, that line from zero sum to positive sum. Yeah. And one of the things when we went to Singing Frog Farms, um, you and Claudia and I, Dave, um, one of the things that, that hit me and lots of things hit me really well, that was such a great trip. Um, one of the things that hit me is <clears throat> if you go to regen or permaculture or whatever, you have suddenly made enemies with the wealthy people in your, your nearest town because those are the people that represent caterpillar, fertilizers, pesticides, and all the things you're going to stop buying. You're, you're basically going off grid um, or off the, off the plantation or whatever, off the reservation, I guess it's called. Terrible sayings. Where do we get these all sayings? <laughs> they're, all, they're all lousy. Um, you're, you're basically breaking the local economy, which depends on everybody buying a whole bunch of that stuff and being in, you know, in debt. And the, bank, and the bankers aren't going to love you because you're not going to need large loans for all that stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So, so super interesting. But it's an interesting moment, too, because and I've had a number of these conversations where, you know, ranchers and farmers are just getting crushed. So 
they're barely holding on or going bankrupt anyway. So it's, you know, it's kind of like, well, this economy is going away one way or another. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm not sure how that plays into the dynamics that you're talking about. There because it's not a healthy economy. It yeah, it's a mess. It's um, the food system's in trouble just from economics, never mind everything else that's happening with it. Yeah, and the, and the climate change component and, the, and just kind of the environmental degradation piece, it matters, right? I mean, we're talking yeah. huge damages that you know, we should have been able to ameliorate. So two people who were yeah. in the crowd of visioneering were state senators from Wyoming, and both looked like they'd been fed lots of beef for a long time, um, <clears throat> but they were really good. They were like, we need to save the small farmers. This is a crisis, and they were on stage, and one of them was on stage in a vest and cowboy hat, looking large and sort of in charge. Um, and, and actually kind of a little teary-eyed because, you know, I'm an eighth-generation farmer and we're going away. We're an, we're an endangered species. Sorry, Jimmy, you are going to jump in. Was I? Oh, I probably probably with a smart-ass comment. Oh, um, but I did actually spend the day uh, Wednesday. It was actually, that's, you remember the email saying that I'm glad that you shifted the date of this. Uh, all day Wednesday, I was at an IFTF uh, meeting with the Dairy Farmers of America on a future of milk project yeah. um and it was very interesting basically you had of the eight people who were there four were from the organization and four were actual hands-on dairy farmers oh cool hands-on I mean, dairy farm with like two thousand head of milk cows but you know it's a lot of hands it, on it, comparatively small farms compared to the, the big industrial farms that produce 50, six, almost 60% of the milk that's consumed in the U.S. comes from five large industrial farms. Five large farms. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, how many people in the room were lactose intolerant? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know, but the two people who were leading the project were both uh, hardcore vegan. And the, the dairy people knew that going in. So that was actually, that was an interesting experience. And I, um, I went to, uh, I finished high school in Huntington Beach, California, and I used to ride my bike to work, to school, to work. Uh, right past a dairy, which I am positive is no longer there. But you could tell, you didn't have to be looking around to tell when the dairy was getting close. Well, and that's a good example. You go, if, I don't know, if you get a, a chance, I mean, I mean to, to go to a, a regenerative dairy, but again, you can tell. I mean, they don't they don't smell. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, it's just they're just kind of amazing. So, when you actually work with nature, so many problems go away, right? And 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 I think the problem is that in people's heads, um, it's impossible to make enough food doing regenerative agriculture. That's basically the first thing anybody will say. Yeah, that would be cute. That would be really great but we need to feed a lot of people. So we need the masses of food. And the only way to do that is through industrial production. And I think that's, that's like the first, the first barrier. And then <laughs> that reminds me that one, one of the interesting people I met um, at Visioneering is a guy who kind of was a very early quant on Wall Street, really good with numbers. He does risk mitigation now for corporations. He seems to be a, an executive whisperer who can take issues they don't want to deal with like climate change but can play out, hey, look, here's the risks to your bottom line that I see, and he's completely credible to them, and he helps them create mitigation strategies that lie in the middle somewhere. And clever mitigation strategies, I didn't get that many examples, but you know, if you're gonna build a wall to try to keep the ocean away, why don't you build an adaptable wall, like an adjustable wall that, that goes up easily, or something like that, I don't know. Where, where you're not investing here, you're investing here, but with an idea toward change, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm going to talk to him some more because, uh, you know, trust and risk fit really well together. I liked him a lot. Um, and I was, we were talking earlier about organizational change and cultural change. And Kelly, you you know, that's kind of where we started this conversation. And I was reminded about this guy and, and his approach with, with orgs, with large orgs. Actually, trust was one of the big themes of the conversation on Wednesday. You know, how, you know, how do you maintain trust with uh, your consumers or, or actually ah. they talk about it in a post -cons post consumer language. Um, oh, well, that's good. You know, how do you main maintain trust with your, with the people who are, who are devouring or who are consuming your consuming product? Food's fine. Um, um, did they have like trust milk question mark t-shirts? No. 
No, although I, I really have been trying to lay the groundwork for the idea to start spreading the rumor that the whole Hamilton thing emerged as a response to the old um, Aaron Burr, Burr, Burr got milk ad. I, n I missed Aaron Burr saying got milk. No, no, it, it was a, uh, an oh. ad from like, God, the early 90s, uh, maybe even the 1980s of a historian that was listening to a radio program. And for, for the $1,000, you know, here's our prize question. Who shot Alexander Hamilton? And this guy's like in this museum type type room with like the bullet that killed Alexander Hamilton and all these Aaron Burr things. But he just took a bite of a peanut butter sandwich and his milk glass of milk was empty. So he's calling and brr, 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 brr. Now I get it. I totally missed that ad. I'm going to look it up on YouTube when we're done here. I'm sure you can find it because it was I actually a really big thing for a while. Um, and I, I, I I'm 99.999 continuing uh, percent sure that uh, Lynn Miranda, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda, did not get inspired to do the Hamilton musical on the basis of that ad. But I just really want to start that rumor. I think that's a good bet and an interesting rumor. And you know, see, there's a, there's a, and then there's a dystopic version of that rumor you started. And then somehow or another, that there, there's a massive break in at the museum that like, all the stuff is stolen, and you know the people. I don't know. There's the, you know you think it's an innocent, cute little rumor, and then you know it just all goes wrong. <laughs> you know, it looks like a cute little pet, and then it gets claws and teeth, and then you feed it after midnight. <laughs> exactly. Don't want to do that. Hey, I stuck a link into the to the movie The Biggest Little Farm. If you guys haven't haven't, I, it's on my list of things to see. It's a beautiful little, little uh, it's all regenerative, but it's a beautiful, yeah. well done, you know, kind of mainstream movie about a farm. And I see that Kelly put in a link to the ad. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Clever girl. <laughs> so I've been um, spending most of my time, I have um, to do a 30 minute presentation on climate uh, at, uh, in two weeks for the 10 year forecast. And this is a group of people who are all, you know, the audience members are all people who are very familiar with the basics. So this is, this is not gonna be an intro to carbon or even a let's make sure we all believe kind of thing. It's okay, you know what's happening. Now let's think through the repercussions. And I, while I don't directly address the term trust, I think it underlies a lot of a lot of this because the approach that I've taken is to look at um, not the political, economic, um, technological issues, but uh, three themes of rage, fear, and grief, hmm. um, and uh, just the. I, I wrote, you know, when, when I wrote about the, the initial forecast in April. I put it in line around the, our descendants may not forgive us. And then only to hear Greta Thunberg say more or less the same thing a, you know, a couple of weeks ago. It's like, yeah, this is, this is, a, re this is a real issue that pe some people are furious. Uh, you may or may not be aware that both the Christchurch sh uh, shooter and the El Paso shooter, right wing alt right maniacs uh, included little bits about climate anger not mm. being not as disbelievers but as being angry that this is happening as part of their manifestos oh really yeah mm. yes um and mm. fear is you know a lot of this a lot of the that is talking about migration and refugees you know i i think there is an argument to be made that steve bannon's plans are, you know, around immigration had or have a climate aspect that he just oh. kn he knew his audience would not accept. I think he's pumping that. I probably, yeah, he's pumping he's it now. Pumping so, so, um, and then I, grief, grief is you know yeah. not just soul nostalgia, but just that recognition that we could have done something. We knew what we had to do, and we didn't do it. And just you know, watching, you know, I don't know if you saw that there was a funeral for a glacier in Iceland. Mm -hmm. in August and a funeral for a glacier in Switzerland. Switzerland, they put a plaque. In, just last month. They put a right. plaque. Um, well, one of the so interesting things, and, and this seems, this is probably a different level than what you're talking about there, but one of the things that I, I heard in the last month or so that was new to me was, was trying, I, I keep trying to reframe it away from climate and away from carbon. They kind of feel like we're too reductionist there. 
And one of the storylines that I was hearing was kind of around a hydrology cycle. Um, so in the, in the metaphor, soil is a sponge, but how, what we're, you know, it, it's a system, a more systems oriented kind of thing. It's not like we just need to remove carbon and everything gets better, right? We have to mean, we have to realize that we're in this complicated system and we're participating in it, we're bringing it up. So, so what is the, you know, what's the kind of the metaphor that you're using for that system? And I'm finding that the hydrology cycle kind of stuff to be pretty helpful. And, if, and again, because it has multiple implications too, right? It's not, you know, this idea that we're just going to take a bunch of carbon out of the air and make jewelry out of it or something like that. Right, right. Um, we're, we're, you know, we, we have to, we have to deal with these other kinds of byproducts and stuff. So for whatever it's worth, I, I Thank I thought, you. Part of the fear, uh, the fierce portion of the uh, uh, the song and dance, um, very mournful song and dance, uh, mm. is um, Are you going to wear a hood? A, actually, a plague doctor mask. Perfect. Um, is about what's called uh, desynchronization of first bloom. So. First bloom, according is the term that botanists use to describe the the point in the seasonal cycle when plants first, you know, flowering plants first bloom, mm -hmm. um, and that is based on temperature, um, and requires the presence of pollinators for those plants to reproduce properly. Right. The migration of pollinators is not based on temperature; it's based on other cycles. Um, and uh, light levels, I think. And what we're seeing is a desynchronization of the point of first bloom and the arrival of pollinators, such that plants are less and less reproducing properly and pollinators aren't being fed properly. Mm -hmm. And migratory birds are, are losing food. 76% um, of wildlife refuges in the United States are reporting a early seasonal, early first bloom. 50% are reporting an extremely early first bloom uh, against historical records. Uh, and so that's kind of like mind blowing to think about, do we have these systems that have, that evolved to be integrated and mm -hmm. to truth be told, will evolve to be integrated again. Right, they'll readapt. In, I mean, in, a, in enough time, but that's longer than our lifespans. Same thing happens when temperatures change in a hilly area and suddenly mosquitoes are, uh, present 200 feet or 400 feet higher than they used to be and that changes ecosystems up and down um, are some pine bark be pine bark beetles yeah are, are, are um have now taken hold further north than they used to simply Ooh. because they would not they previously would get frozen out there wasn't enough warm warm weather right uh, in you know in the northern latitudes of the right. united states and also at some point somewhere, I don't think I, I'll check my brain to see if it's in there, but I thought I saw, either read an article or saw a video about a single field and how during the day at different stages, different flowers bloom open uh, and appeal to different pollinators. So, so it was really interesting. It was this sort of you know, naturally choreographed sequence where, where birds would come in and see, and, and different insects can see different parts of the spectrum so that the plants that like them, that want them as their pollinators, basically just like, oh look, it's like neon to them in the field. And it was going through all of that and, and, and how, but, but how time of day played a role as well, which was super interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, if nobody's around on the time of day when you've got your sign out saying, you know, the, the, the lodge is open. Um, Eat at Joe's. That's bad news, yeah. Yeah. Eat, at, eat at Joe's Petunia. Exactly. Um, um, let me, and, and let me go back to your, your thesis for a second. This may not help your presentation, but it occurs to me that our conversation about the grid and battery storage is really parallel to fear and anger. And that mm -hmm. what's happening is that we're storing up like all these, all this malfeasance, all this lack of, of working on stuff, all this overhang of crap that younger people are inheriting is like a battery. Um, and it, you know, it, need, it needs to be let out every now and then, hence protests, but you know, it could be turned to some good as well if we, sort of, if we figure out how to, how to connect these things up. But I think th there's an energy metaphor here that, that, that my brain was sort of chewing on as you were talking. I'll, I'll mull that back, I'll mull that in my back brain. But, um, but yeah, the, this trilogy of rage, fear, and grief 
um, rage really applying to younger people, fear hitting hard in the political system, grief, uh, that's me. Um, and this has been an, 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 a, an emotionally wrenching presentation development, but at the same time feels critical to be speaking in that language now. Mm -hmm. um, we can't just talk about parts per million. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we can't just talk about um, emissions, uh, um, oh, I'm so, something like on the term, right? emissions levels and the lag between emissions and temperature. We have to be talking about how people will respond. Mm -hmm. And so you know, talking to these mostly business people saying, your stakeholders are going to be depressed you will have you'll have large parts of your workforce who don't feel like they have a future or who feel complicit in taking away our future ptsd something akin to ptsd will be you know increasingly common i think we're seeing we're starting to see it now um and and you can't forget to maintain you know take care of your own emotions you can't you have to be able to put the mask on bef yourself before you put the mask on others um and there, it's, sorry i was just curious no, from the from the is there a counter is there an opposite take on that I, was, is, and I don't know if it's true but i have this image that like world war ii there was kind of a the collective response led to almost a euphoria around engagement and meaning and mission I mean, is there is is there a hypothetical which is a positive version, which is this actually could be could be unifying and could be energizing, and it certainly has lots of innovation potential. I don't know things like that. I'm just I'm trying to come up with a happy side to this. Uh, Great question, David. Great question. Um, possibly, the big you know the most significant difference uh, between something like a World War II and something like this is the time. You know, the, the amount of time you have to act, the amount of time necessary for your act to result in something. Um, so you, you know, send the women into the factories, you, you know, give the men rifles and send them off to Europe. And, you know, that all takes place pretty quickly and you see the effects very quickly. Something called hysteresis, that's the term I was looking for before. Um, thermal, uh, ocean thermal inertia, a variety of other ways about the system is slow. Uh, we could stop putting any carbon into the atmosphere right this very second globally and we would still see another couple of decades of warming continued warming not just you know, and we'll see continued temperatures at this level for centuries so it's there isn't a fast response fast visible response that's actually one of the one of the p political dilemmas and i think i've brought this up here before that you will ask people to make major changes in their lives and they won't see any benefit from it. You know, at least not, not in the short term. But agriculture folks would argue that, you know, the goal is not, again, get carbon out of the air necessarily. The goal is increased photosynthesis, right? So, and it turns out you can dramatically increase photosynthesis pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know what the, I don't know about this reverse climate change kind of format. That's, that seems questionable to me. But I think we could, I mean, you know, and, and NASA just had some research recently talking about the world is greening, right? Because of mostly China and India. Um, but I, I do think that, again, we've, we've been looking at this as a technical problem from the industrial side. And I feel like we've, we're missing a big chunk of the story. So, and, 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 and I got to drop off. This is so much fun. I really enjoy it. <laughs> fun? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was... but, and I would love to have coffee again. So I don't know, you know, if you get really depressed and want to get together and have coffee, I'll try coffee. That's actually so, one so. of the things that my first slide in the grief section is, is a picture of a cup of coffee because it turns out coffee. <laughs> no, beans, not my coffee. Don't take away my coffee. No. Coffee beans are extremely fragile. It's a bummer you have to drop off because I wanted you to riff more on what you just said, Dave. But yeah, uh, I got to drop off. Thank you for being call. here. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks for doing this. It was really fun. Um, go ahead, Jimmy. No, it's just, I, I, you remember world changing, Jerry. You remember, I, I, I spent years and years writing about <laughs> solutions, things we can do to fix this problem. And a voice 
in the forest? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, first, you had, you had and have a following. Um, second, have you considered like turning the volume to 11 or something like that? I mean, there are, there are YouTube celebrities, there are YouTubers who kind of just amp things up and suddenly go from 100,000 views to a million views. And you've got like the stentorian voice that's perfect for this. Um, you're really good on cam, on stage, whatever, whatever. And you have a shit ton of things you could say extemporaneously without preparing scripts. You could just go. Uh, you could have people on. You could rake them over the coals. You could praise them and hug them. You could tell fart jokes. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I mean, really, uh, if, if you wanted to just crank the volume up, I think you might actually break through. And uh, all of that to say... Greta Thunberg has broken through and we're still not doing anything big, so maybe that wouldn't help so much. But, but, but that jaded view aside, it might actually help. Um, I wish that you could be right. Have you tried? Um, How do you know I'm wrong? Trust me. No. Um, ah! I have tried in, in, in different ways at different times, never to any kind of full um, military campaign level. Uh, I'm also conscious of the fact that I'm another old white guy and it's really time for old white guys to sit down and shut up around a lot of this shit. You could be the old white guy who brings everybody else, all the women and people of color on the issue in as guests and goes, you, you, you but, talk, you talk, you talk. But, but also people are still listening to old white guys, especially other old white guys, which I really feel like so appreciative of the old white guys who are standing up and saying these things, right? Because there's a, even still, there's a, um, what's the word when you have the, I'm gonna listen to the other old white guy. I can't remember the word. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Credibility? No. Yeah. Yeah. That that Something kind of thing, that? right? Like, oh, he here is someone who looks like us <laughs> saying these words that we don't want to hear or understand. And so I don't think that is I think that's a a point in your corner. And you've just made it slightly better to be an old white guy today, for which I thank you, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> I just have to say I just have to say it's these days, there are a few days when it's really a great thing to, to be that. So, hey. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate being surrounded by old white guys who are saying all the right words, right? Because it, like the executive summit, I was thrilled. There were two things that happened. One, we were gender balanced in the room, 27 people, and we were gender balanced, which we often wow. are at consortium events cool. because... <laughs> Greg likes to say that women understand this better than men, which I is another thing that I love because that kind of makes me a little bit crazy in terms of, you know, assigning yeah. gender roles that way. But, um, but the other thing that happened was there were, and all of the men in the room are great advocates for equality and for like all of these things that we are sort of working toward. And, and one of them who used to make me crazy because he, felt like such a sort of a stick in the mud patriarch has changed his language to talk about other executives as being well when he or she gets into that position you know blah blah like had changed the way he was talking about pronouns to include he or she as opposed to just the default he and mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how much that made a difference for me right like I couldn't believe how much I noticed it and I couldn't believe how much I appreciated it because mm -hmm. I don't my tendency is to just not I don't think that I think about stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. I know I, we, we default, the default gender's male and that's fine and blah, blah, blah. But to have this particular guy really, it, he seemed to have made a shift in the last probably five years and it seemed to be unconscious at this point, right? He wasn't performing his He's internalized equality. it. He's internalized it. And it was, Ooh, wow. it was, it was hugely gratifying, right? Just, mm -hmm. it was very interesting. So, you know, right. it's funny because that, that actually makes you think of something um, that I read a while ago that really struck me and it parallels that around the, um, the, visible, the visible announcement in things like email and your Twitter bio and such of what pronouns you use. Mm -hmm. And, okay, no one's going to, a few people are going to look at me and wonder, does this person use a he or a she or maybe a they? Um, or Z. I, you know, but by putting it on in my Twitter bio, what I'm doing is I'm making it visible so that people who do fear these, you know, have fears around this can see that this is a person who listens. 
this is a person who's paying attention. Um, you know, and you know, I had, I had been kind of, I had felt kind of a pushback against, oh God, it seems really silly to be putting he, she, you know, whatever, you know, he, him on as, as my signature file in an email. But now I get it. I get why having that visible matters. Um, I, as far as the climate stuff is concerned, um, it's really hard for me not to think it's too that it's already too late and i'll you know being completely honest with you um i look at the stuff i you you know that i my work my life is all about looking at how big systems intertwine and i look at big system the big systems around climate and around trade and around energy and around politics and tribalism and nationalism and there are some improvements. I think Mez is, is absolutely right with regards to energy and he's incredibly optimistic. And I wish I could be that optimistic. Um, but there are just so many pieces that aren't working well in ways that aren't just non-productive, they're counterproductive. So when you say what you just said, um, I do a little bit of mental logic and extrapolate to mean that you think it's an extinction level event. Not that you think things are so shitty we can't reverse them, but that we're probably all gonna die because of this. Because, because if not, you'd be like, well, things are gonna get really crappy, but we need to get busy to protect these people and those people and those people in this way and change this policy. There would be a lot to do because there's gonna be trauma. So I'm interpreting what you just said as, we are well and royally fucked. No, I, um, and I appreciate you saying that because that's not exactly what I mean. I, I do mean more along the lines of we are looking at centuries, d decades, probably centuries of misery uh, for most people on the planet. But mi mi misery mitigation is a busy is a busy thing. There's a, there's your new career. When when young people ask you what career should I go into, misery, misery mitigation. mitigation. Totally, I'm a misery mitigator. You are, Jerry. <laughs> oh God, that just sounds awful. Um, <laughs> By, by the way, April just landed in Changji Airport. She's flying home from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, she has a long layover in Changji, which is now like the world's most like crazy, interesting airport. They've done all kinds of cool stuff. So she's going to totally enjoy that because who loves airports? April loves airports. <clears throat> and then she has like long flights in economy class to get home. But uh, <clears throat> she sends her love. I, I said, do you want to jump on the call? And she said, I got, I got stuff I got to say out here. Tell her hello and tell her not to say anything about Winnie the Pooh. Uh, yeah, or she may not make her next flight. Oh, but it's Singapore. Do they? Oh, no, Singapore. Okay. For some Singapore. reason, I thought Shang Yeah. No, she's, she's not in Shenzhen. No, yeah. Okay. That'd be very different. Um, and then a, a, a small second thing, uh, as you, if you want to really dramatize your presentation and you don't usually use background music, but I highly recommend Barber's Adagio for Strings, uh, which is the kind of the dirge they played at Kennedy's. When Kennedy was killed, they put this on the radio. It's a, it's a, and people understand this as kind of uh, beautiful dirge music. And it also, uh, it, there's a crescendo in it. So at some point, <clears throat> at some point, the music rises, 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 peaks, and you could build your whole narrative arc to peak with the music. It would be quite a stunning thing. I, I, that would be interesting to experiment with. Um. Or maybe, or maybe um, do the speech and then re remix it, um, refactor it, and do, shoot a video with music as background. So what I have done for this, for the presentation, and I, I have to get back to working on it here today, uh, is inter an interstitial between every section of uh, pictures of my cats. That, you know, this is, this is how I cope. And I know that this, this talk is going to be rough for some people. So I'm offering up pictures of my kitties along, you know, here and there along the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's kind of silly, but at the same time, I, it just, I don't, I don't like feeling like this. I honestly yeah. don't. Um, it may seem like I do, but I don't. Uh, I would really much rather, you know how much I want to be wrong? Mm -hmm. I would, I desperately want to be absolutely 100% wrong about mm -hmm. all of this. I would be mm -hmm. so happy 
so utterly happy to be wrong. Um, I, yeah, I'm glad I don't have kids. Mm -hmm. The thing I, I love about Thunberg, Thunberg and, and the responses to her, and there's a whole bunch of far righties that are freaking out about her in interesting yeah. ways. Um, but the, the things I like are sort of people saying, hey, hey, look, here's an angry young woman who doesn't feel like she needs to smile for anybody, doesn't feel she needs to kowtow to anybody, isn't on anybody else, anybody's program. She needs, to, she needs to be careful about what she endorses and whom now because she's so central <coughs> that that's gonna cause a whole bunch of sort of contagious backlash. But, but, but she's in these environments where she's angry and, and, is, and this is like appropriate anger and she's manifesting it really well. And that makes me happy too. I love that clip of her watching as Trump walks through the hall. I mean, just... Did you see the Did you see the the little gift that somebody made of it, which is like they've got the label the asteroid, the asteroid one, Earth and asteroid uh, on them, like like Trump says Earth, and then asteroid is on on Greta. Uh, I haven't seen that one. No, I, I but I did did do a screen grab of this that look of pure hatred in on her face as you know, f for my talk. I guess I'm talking more about like Dana Carvey than a hating, hating person there, but still. But anyway, hey, it's Friday. It's Friday. <laughs> I was worried, but now I'm not. Uh, and and um, I, I, I honestly, honestly, I really apologize because I do this every damn time and I'm sick of it. I'm probably as sick of it as you guys are. And I'm... I am, yeah, I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Um, you're chewing on one of the world's great issues and you're doing so in, with whole heart. Um, and um, you think through these things very beautifully and we are, I am happy to be of help if we can be, um, uh, to help you think them through, to help you whatever, whatever. Um, and, and really, we, we love you, but there's no, don't be sorry. No sorry. Just happy to witness it, Jamir. And Please, I'm no sorry. I'm very happy to be part of your journey. Thank you. Yeah. So what are you up to, Bo? Philosophy. Peloponnesian War. Play you know, that's not the way most people answer that question. I've, had, I've been, so I've been reading this really great book. Um, Modernity and Plato. Oh. And uh, it has a lot of markers in it. <laughs> oh, look what, look what Whoa, I dude. All right. So, um, and, and I came across this fantastic paragraph where philosophy explains bigotry. Wow. Can I read it? Yeah, please. Please All do. Right. Opinion is superior to perception because it knows what it has before itself. In contrast to rational thought, however, opinion cannot recognize this function in its specific possibilities purely for itself. I wish Jamaica could read this instead of me. It knows, <laughs> it knows that this is a scissor, a house, etc., and therefore easily believes that everything that is a scissor or a house must have the identical visible properties. That is why opinion, considered purely for itself, has a marked tendency to be intolerant towards everything that is foreign or new to it. Hmm. The foreignness or newness of a thing or the impression of absolute foreignness or newness is not due to the conceptual content of the specific object, but rather due to the different way in which this object realizes a universal and thus familiar content, blah, blah, blah. But wow, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it totally, I, know, so I could go further into it, but wow, I, I love philosophy. <laughs> and it was written by a guy named Arbogast. Arbogast, really. he's a German author. He's a, yeah. So this whole group has been about um, how modernity mistook Plato and Aristotle and oversimplified them, turned them into cartoons, and, and how we came to be in our relativistic time where you know, it's all relativism. So when it's relative, by the way, there's no shared truth anymore. And, and, and this explains also the deterioration of our politics. 
it explains why we don't have any, there's no shared truth anymore. Climate, you name it, right? I mean, and so I was I'm reading this. It's just like, okay, well, why don't I go check the history about this? Well, uh, Plato and Aristotle, okay, what happened? Well, the Peloponnesian War, uh, a vast, huge, you know, empire, Athens, uh, peaks and then starts to go into decline and starts pushing people around and colonies and, and, um, and God dies, the gods are dead. Uh, it's just so eerily our own time because Plato and Aristotle were, were sophistry had happened too. So, you know, everybody got cynical. Everybody just became every man for himself and woman for himself, you know, just became all that. And um, so they wanted to reclaim the truth. Both Plato and Aristotle were obsessed about how can we have like talk, have a shared discourse again? How can we agree on what's true and what's real? And that was like their driving goals. Uh, so, I'm reading this and it's just like, oh my God, it looks just like our time. I mean, an aged empire in decline, Athens, hmm, America, hmm, huge long war, Peloponnesian War, hmm, how long many years have we been in war? Uh, anyways, the parallels, I'm just reading this going, oh, history certainly does rhyme. And it's so the, uh, the history of the, uh, the, the Thucydides book on the history of the Peloponnesian War is actually considered to be standard reading in political science had to read that in my core course at Irvine and didn't actually finish it. I, I think I plotted through it, unfortunately. I, I wasn't into it back then. Just watch 300. It's more or less the same thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> 300. So, 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 Bo, at some point over some beers, I want to have this conversation because I have a very contrarian opinion about everything you just said. Oh. Um, so to me, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle are the start of the fuck up of the world that, um, and, and for example, I was at an interesting little conference seven, eight, 10 years ago, uh, and Richard Foster, Dick Foster from McK the McKinsey guy who wrote about S-curves, he got up and he spoke, and you could tell as he was prepping to speak in his, his introduction, this was like his valedictory speech. He had thought really hard about this, <clears throat> and it was all about human thought and all that, and he starts with Plato and Aristotle, and I immediately go, you asshole, because there was thinking way before them. If you read The Alphabet Versus the Goddess uh, by Leonard Schlein and a bunch of other stuff, indigenous ways of knowing way before were, to my mind, much healthier than what Plato and Aristotle do to us. And we're why, busy, why are Plato and Aristotle not indigenous ways of knowing? They're absolutely not. They're busy building these philosophical foundational stones that everybody else is going to lay building blocks on top of that don't really accord in many ways with indigenous cosmologies. Yeah. Uh, and, and I... And I <laughs> haven't thought that question through, so I'm gonna go dig a bit and, and look at it. But they do not represent whatsoever uh, indigenous ways of knowing. They, they represent some wholesale way of philosophizing our existence on earth and, and building sort of an edifice around that. And so we have logic and structures on top of this that we think is how civilization is supposed to work. To me, it's not, okay? So, <clears throat> so I put in it here, <clears throat> so you said we had sophistry back then, it was a terrible thing. So I, everybody gets a different thing from the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, probably. The thing I got from Zen was, oh, what if the sophists were right? And what if they got written into history as the assholes who could take anybody's position? Because, because basically this is the battle that he's saying is that Plato and Aristotle against the sophists back in the day. And so Plato and Aristotle win. So they're the heroes and we base all of our civilization on them. To me, the sophists might've been the heroes. And if you start looking up sophistry, it's different from what you think it is, just like, um, what's the word? Uh, we're gonna fall into, so oh God. no, no, uh, anarchy. Just like the word anarchy is the demonization of a whole bunch of really, really good ideas. Like the anarchists, a lot of the anarchists had fabulous ideas, but they got branded as anarchists. Anarchy got branded as this thing that's gonna take us down the shithole, so we need these forms of political, social, and economic control, which we bought into because otherwise anarchy. Yeah. So to me, the narrative is, what if the other side had won? I'm, I think we're basing civilization on the wrong sets of thinking. Well, right now we're doing sophistry very well. Well, because depends what you mean by sophistry. <clears throat> depends what you mean by sophistry. If you mean double time, I, see, I don't think sophistry is double speak or well, lying or whatever. These are fruitful conversations <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Uh, and totally. uh, 
I have a great guy for us to bring along to do it too. So that'd be great. I love that. And, and I've never taken a philosophy class in my life. I'm an amateur on this. I, you, you're like, you, you've read so much more than I have on all this, but, but my whole, my whole view of the world <clears throat> is what I just said. Um, and, and in the talks I just gave, I just gave similar talks in two different venues to two completely different audiences, but in the middle of it now, and I, I can show this to you guys on the next call or we can build a separate call around it, <clears throat> but I have my story. My story of trust is basically that long ago around the world, we used to know how to live in community on the commons. And we got that. And those words, community and commons, in whatever dialect or whatever the local way of expressing was, were everybody knew that's how we stayed alive. Then we broke that worldwide, mostly in the colonial era. We went around, the Catholic Church went around and stamped this out of everybody on purpose with great force and said, you can't wear your native clothes, you can't speak your native tongue, we're gonna dress you up and make you Catholic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we get um, the you know, mercantilism and we get industrialism, then we get consumerism, all of which repeat this abuse and destroy cultures around the world. Um, and now we are naively rediscovering some of the, the wisdom we had way back when about how to take care of troublemakers in the tribe, um, how to take care of your ground. And, and our knowledge about how to take care of our commons was very hard won <clears throat> because First, we killed off all the megafauna. So wherever humans touch a continent, the megafauna go away. The fossil record just, no more, no more megafauna. But then over time, a bunch of cultures disappear, but a bunch of them thrive. And so for example, on a couple recent calls, I mentioned uh, uh, some books and videos I've seen on how in Australia, and when the first fleet shows up, and when the, when the Europeans show up on the shores of Australia and come ashore, <clears throat> if you read their journals in handwriting, it says, I can't believe it. The woods here, when you, when you ride your horse through, are open. It's like a gentleman's garden. You can reach up and there's an apple. You look down and there's a gourd. It's amazing how this naturally showed up. And they, they do not attribute any of this to the wisdom of the locals who they think are lazy and stupid. Like, look how lazy this guy is pulling fish out of the river. Well, for 30,000 years, he's been going to the same weir that his ancestors created. And when he knows the fish are about to run, he blocks the bottom of the weir, fish pile up inside the weir, he goes and he's like, meh, got some protein for a while. He's really smart because they're watching the environment, planting things, and there's a ring around Australia that was fertile, except then the first fleet comes and the same hat thing happens to the Native Americans, the guns, germs, and seal. <clears throat> and Let's not go too far into the Rousseau thing that everything was wonderful for Hunter Gavin. And I, I, you can have Rousseau and you can dunk him in the river, hate Rousseau. Good. And, and, and so, but everybody brings up Rousseau. This is not the noble Kelly, why, why is Kelly laughing? Is Kelly laughing like, what kind of conversation have I landed into? Rousseau, Rousseau is like the first defense against this argument. It's like, no, 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 we can't go look at the noble savage. That, that, that never happened. It doesn't work. And I'm like, bullshit people. We used to know how to live in community, on the commons, and that really mattered to us. And we understood that if we broke those things, we, we, we died. And so we're having a large scale version of that right now. So to me, modernity and Plato, I don't know, Bo, and I wanna have that conversation in depth. Um, and I think we should record it and see what we can do with it, just because I think it's really super, super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I, let's play I'm with gonna, that. I'm gonna insist there'll be one other guy there with me. Okay. Sounds great, and I'm gonna bring a second too, and you get to choose the weapons. <laughs> I say, I say should, should shotgun I, microphones just because it sounds good. <laughs> All right. We have a showdown, a philosophy we are, smackdown. We are such lovely dweeb, aren't we? <laughs> it's just what well, it should be, baby. <laughs> so, so I think what's funny is what we've gotten to here accidentally at the end of our call is something we all care about a lot and that we've been digging on and chewing on personally a lot. And I, I, the number of bookmarks and underlines and comments in your book says how much you care about this particular topic and how the, the book you're reading illustrated for you that this moment is parallel to what they're saying. And, no, no, no. Like, and I understood that and I heard that. And it's just that it conflicted with my view of how history works and, and who said what to whom. But I love that, right? So, so I, like- We care. We I say, care. Let, let's go on this. Let's, yeah, let's, absolutely. Uh, the, all, all, the only thing we can lose is our own ignorance. And I am determined to get rid of as much of my ignorance as possible before I die. Excellent. Love that. Love that. Um, so we're right at the end of our normal call time. Jemaine's got to actually go create a speech. 
Um, any last words from anybody on this? And uh, maybe what we'll do is set up either a Rex call or maybe I'll do an Inside Jerry's Brain call <clears throat> around this, or maybe we sit down in a coffee shop and set up a camera. We'll figure out what to do about this, Bo, but whatever you're comfortable with, maybe you're not comfortable with recording it. Um, I think it would be useful to record it. I think it'd be great really to, useful. yeah, I'd love to. Um, and we, we should take our time with it somehow. Maybe it's a two or three conversation thing, I don't know. Um, any, last, any last words from anybody on this call? Well, since Kelly's been laughing so much, I want to hear from Kelly. <clears throat> Yay. I call these phone calls my filling the well call because I, there's a bunch of yammering that happens in my world that's all very specific to my world. And so I love coming to these calls because it's so many different perspectives on so many different things. And so I am so grateful to be here and have the well filled. And now I get to go make connections with other things. Yay. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. Oh, and um, back to our battery thing. One thing just came into my head. <laughs> Too bad Susan wasn't on the call because uh, Susan lives in a house that is off the grid. It's basically three miles downhill off of Skyline in the valley. They've had battery trouble forever. They have a huge bank of batteries in the backyard and, the, and, a, and a diesel generator. And basically they, they charge up the batteries at the generator. They're off grid. And so they've been dealing with for ages and the batteries last I heard were all getting old and not recharging properly, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I don't know if they've bought a Tesla battery bank or what's happened, but she's been living the, the, the off-grid battery life for a long time. So back to our regularly scheduled program. Any other thoughts? Um, my piece on the apocalypse for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, is, is, going, is going to print. So I will have a link when it's available, I'll send, that, send it out. <laughs> put, it on, put it on the list. Because please. of course. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Doom. <laughs> love you to me, big hug to me. Big yeah. Hug to me. yeah, exactly, exactly. I say that with love. I know, I know you do, Jerry. Wear your doom with a smile. <laughs> I always do. Yeah. And that makes people worry. You always doom, I mean do. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, sweet. Then let's, let's, uh, let's wrap this call and, uh, and see what we would do with all this thing. Nice work, Jermaine. That was very video effecty. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 all right, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.